Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Reinsurance Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jared Lee. And I'm Ben Rays. Welcome, sir. Thank and you very much. Look at you. We're in your hood up inside. <laughs> don't preemptively... <laughs> no, don't pro... Oh, hang on, hang on. There's a better word. <laughs> don't prematurely preempt my episode synopsis, Jared. But actually, we are doing catastrophes today, and that's why I have my hood up. <laughs> Fabulous. I'm now going to take it down because it's very warm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we wanted to spend a bit of time. This will be a short episode. We probably won't spend loads more time diving into later, but talking about the myriad ways that the industry sort of manages catastrophe losses specifically, not only with wearing their rain jackets inside, but other ways. Exactly. And I think the real reason we wanted to go into that topic is because it's actually a really exciting topic for reinsurance nerds, yeah. because we can delve, although it's probably going to be a shorter episode today based on our next meeting uh, that we have to run to. But uh, basically, the way that you build reinsurance structures to tackle more complex catastrophe exposures uh, is actually one of the most exciting areas, in my opinion, yeah. of reinsurance well and i th when you look at the bulk of reinsurance at least the bulk of the premium uh, that flows through it is focused on catastrophe as a category right so you have the most innovation around the structure of deals everything from second and third event covers like you have reinstatements a simple one like that catastrophe we use all of our reinsurance in that event reinstatements come in and you have like the bases basic elements of how do we protect against these really big, sizable events that can happen, you know, uh, a number of times throughout a year? Um, and then all the way through to structure things and then net new products, things like cat bonds, right? Industry loss warranties that exist if, if the industry as a whole has suffered a loss due to these large events. So there's so much innovation that happens here all around helping clients protect themselves against the potential risk of a catastrophe. I've had an idea. Go for it. I think we should try and explore this category by imagining that the wall behind us is a giant whiteboard and we are sat with a blank piece of whiteboard paper, yeah. so to speak, uh, trying to deal with catastrophes mm -hmm. and trying to work out how insurance and reinsurance products could be designed to cope with them. Okay. And in so doing, nurture our listeners through the process by which some of the things you just mentioned may have emerged. Yep. So perhaps we can take turns to play the role of a clever catastrophe, a cunning catastrophe okay. that usurps the authority of traditional contracts. Okay. So, uh, okay, let's let's try a basic scenario. Basic scenario. Uh, you've got a policy. Yep. And it's covering you for all risks, let's say. Yep. I one hit and I go, boom, massive hurricane comes in mm -hmm. I, and it covers, like, it's, it's massive, it's huge. Huge, huge, huge loss. Mm -hmm. Who's happy? Who's unhappy of your your client, your reinsurers, etc.? So, if is my pol I'm the policyholder. I'm the insurance company. You're gonna have to wear different hats and be all of them. I'm all of them. Jump around. Fine. Um, <laughs> Change voice if you can. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that will be well beyond the the uh, artistic skill sets that we've got on this podcast. You've got a pretty good. Um, so I think you have it. You're right. So day one is all of the policyholders super disrupted their lives are sort of in shambles houses flooded houses destroyed um and then you fly in all the insurance companies who out of the out of the gates are paying for everything right they're flying in and bringing in um claims assessment teams and and teams to help people relocate and putting up money for hotels and and all the services um already having conversations with their reinsurers about what is happening and what types of policies that are happening there. So there's a, this real assessment of what is the exposure that we're t essentially taking on. I know there's a bunch of technology here now where even in real time, you're watching a storm come through that you're able to look at your portfolio of risk and assess if the storm follows these various tracks, what's the likely exposure that we'll have. So there's even preemptive communication that's helping these parties. But the contracts are all in place. So it's more of a how much is this going to hurt? And everyone kind of short-term focusing on that. So let's go back in time then and let's pretend that your initial contract mm -hmm. before you knew that a catastrophe could happen was simply a follow the fortunes quota mm -hmm. share style agreement where it's like, oh, I've taken on lots of exposure as the insurance company. 
I so therefore I'm going to keep fifty percent of my premium and give fifty percent of it away. Yeah. In exchange for fifty percent of my claims being paid every year, but this hurricane that's just come through it's mm. only happened for the first time in like twenty years. Yeah. Doesn't feel right because actually fifty percent of my claim isn't enough. Yeah. I and likewise. 50% of my premium every year feels like a lot to give in exchange for not that much when this only happens once every 20 years. Yep. So how did the industry respond, I guess, in developing so this is structures? this w you'd, you'd have cat bonds as an element here, wouldn't you? I think that's the, even the more advanced one. Uh, yeah. Because I think, I think when a lot of people think about reinsurance, they imagine it as probably straightforwardly this, oh, a reinsurer shares your premiums and, yeah. and pays you a share of your claims. But I think we probably should give credit as well to the concept of excessive loss as coming from mm -hmm. catastrophe insurance. This idea that I I want to, as an insurance company or any kind of student, limit my losses to a certain ceiling yeah. by paying a smallish amount every year yeah. on the basis that we're only going to blow through that ce ceiling very occasionally. Mm -hmm. I, I think that was a product innovation in itself to yeah. stick on our, our whiteboard. In yeah, many so ways. product innovation one was like excess of loss. Yeah, like like yeah. I suddenly we found a way to make it so that rather than you give us a set proportion of your risk every yeah. year, because it's a catastrophe that only happens once every X years, that's there is a means for us working out the return period. How how yeah. frequently in a much wider number of years does this happen? Yeah, and then you only need us to pay one over that number of years. Yeah, in premium. And it'll all even out in the end, yeah. hopefully. It'd be interesting to, to frame this as like a, a timeline of like... Yeah, I don't know any of the dates, unfortunately. <laughs> but, but almost <laughs> without the dates. Yeah. Right? So here's evolution with no, with no archaeological evidence to support it. So I think it's excess of loss, I agree. Um, then I think you have reinstatements. It's like once every 20 years. Except twice. It happened again. Damn, <laughs> damn it. Yeah. Right? And now they're going, okay, so it can happen more than, <laughs> more than once every 20 years. Sometimes it happens the same year. So right. we need to be able to have this policy back. So in case it, or even if it doesn't, in case it does, that we have money to pay for our shareholders or our, our policyholders. So um, reinstatement certainly mm. the next piece. And then those begin to evolve to be. They Probably be terms free. of reinstatement as well. Yeah. 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 So then it could be, well, how does it work? Well, you can pay for it. Can you give it, can I have it for free? Sure. Like yeah. it depends on the depends on the type of risk you're writing. So um, it can be everything from one or two at a hundred percent. So you pay the full premium to get that portion reinstated, or it can be unlimited free, you which think feels like it should be a quota share at that point. Well, yeah, like it's different, obviously, but it's okay. So I'm buying one tower, but you're going to let me reinstate it unlimited times for no additional cost. But they know the the underwriters and the actuaries have understood that that risk is has a very specific profile type. And I, I'm probably at this point over optimizing towards hurricane scenarios. But we mm -hmm. think back to him as it yep. was known, you know, Harvey uh, Maria, Arma, or yeah, whoever it was, <laughs> various first names, yeah, with certain letters of the alphabet. I yeah, that was like a, 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 I was going to say a triple, a yeah. treble, yeah, whatever noun relating to the number three makes most sense. You know, they would have been like, oh bam, you've been hit by the first one, and then shortly afterwards another one, and then shortly afterwards another one after that. That all had to be priced in some way, which is a, an amazing way in which the product has been designed specifically to account for yep. rare but occasionally frequent catastrophes. Yep. Well, and the other thing that you saw was, and I think this is very much, we talk about the value brokers bring to the space, but when you look at structures and towers that have you know, second and third event covers, and, and how those towers look different and where reinsurers go, it's it's an absolute master class on identifying where reinsurers like to sit. So you like to be sort of on the top of a program, fine, but you can be on the bottom of a third event because third events are as unlikely. So you're happy to be low on a third event for more premium there, knowing full well it doesn't actually isn't misaligned to your risk appetite because your risk appetite is top of a tower, but it's more of there because of the unlikely n n nature that risks occur there, right? So it's it's the brokers really understanding where reinsurers' appetites sit, what they're trying to solve for for their clients, and building these bespoke models and structures that will then take 
you know, a client through various un- scenarios, albeit unlikely, that they they want protection against should they happen. Let me throw some more variables at you. I, Go. We've got. That's quite We're in the groove now. Realistic, I hope. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm, for those only listening, I'm not enjoying the full HD video that we're yeah. presenting to audience. I don't know if it's HD. It looks very good. I'm, I think it's 3D now. Oh, we've got those David. We've got, your, got those. We've got those James Cameron yeah. <laughs> cameras. Um, but basically, what happens now? Okay, I'm going to give you another scenario where you're in a very high peak zone. So let's say the severity of the potential loss is so high that actually the private markets are like, yeah, sorry. If you, insurance company, write those policyholders, we're not willing to reinsure mm. that part of your book. What do you do now, reinsurance market? I, I These think mega cats. Yeah, because California you're, earthquake. You certainly need to find other sources of capital, right? If you're if the traditional reinsurers aren't wanting to write it, you need to find the capital, and that's only going to come from the financial markets. Or, in some cases, publics. So government. Uh, oh, well, like catastrophe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which then often, funnily enough, reinteract with I private markets. I even forgot markets. about government pools. You're right. Yeah. And then cat bonds as well, right? In fact, government bonds are one of the biggest, sorry, governments are one of the biggest buyers of cat bonds in the world, yeah. funnily enough. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and you look at how governments protect communities, right? So you have the Florida Hurricane Cat Fund, which is set up and sort of administered by the state of, of Florida that helps allow for insurers to work there because it's so prohibitively expensive if, if the hurricane seasons are bad. Um, you have earthquake programs, you have flood pools that they've that governments have built up to help make sure coverage gets deployed. So you're right, I, I completely forgot about government stepping in and sort of picking up a bit of the banner. They still pass it on oftentimes, right? Yeah. They find buyers and there's always this this chain. We we sort of frame it and paint it very simply as sedent broker reinsure, but you have all these parties that can come in. Governments come in at points, markets come in at some points. There's additional vehicles by which they dump off and offload risk and take on risk. And it's it's all trying to solve a similar point is how does this work? How do we get this system to protect end consumers? Absolutely. And then I, I hope everyone is imagining this incredible diagram take shape on our imaginary whiteboard yeah. of like, and if not there, you know, if, if we haven't got a pool to help us, if, if the reinsurers are unsure about doing it, or we need just a bigger pool of uh, capital to access, yeah. then we get into this world of, I guess, generally insurance linked securities, Yeah, I, which could be pretty much anything from, you know, collateralized reinsurance vehicles to uh, cat bonds, as we discussed, industry loss warranties. Mm-hmm. I all sorts of things that maybe take a pension fund's money, for example, and lock it away in a protective cell company or in some kind of special purpose vehicle such that they receive a premium in exchange for locking away their fund against a very unlikely hit or bust event because they've got so much that it's okay if they lose literally all of it on one very big event. I Again, another great innovation created specifically to respond to the fact that Insurance companies' business will work fabulously well most of the time, but there's yeah. this outside chance that this black swan event, massive category catastrophe, known or unknown, long return period, could just it's, ruin them instantly. Yeah, and it's still hard to do to do and get right. When um, when I started in the industry, every year on Halloween, they had these little gravestones for insurers that had gone bust in the previous year, oh, wow. and it's it's a much bigger number than you'd think. It's Oftentimes, it's small regional carriers, right, that you don't really think about. They get absorbed yeah. somewhere, and another bigger carrier writes them. But like running an insurance company successfully is not easy. We take for granted that all the brands we recognize are multi-hundred year now brands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's huge portions of these small regional carriers that like they had a bunch of homes collapse from a snowstorm and or roofs collapse and they weren't managing their reinsurance appropriately or they and they get strung out and they seek help or they get bailed out by governments and things. So it does happen a lot. Um, I think we see it in particular in response to unexpected catastrophes. You look at yeah. wildfire, for example, sure. massively underinsured yep. peril. I that caused so much disruption, right, in yeah. California and Canada, respectively. Yeah, I think there were quite a few firms clinging on for life after yeah. that. Yeah, and and looking for ways to get bailed out and supported there. So, um, we can certainly. I mean, there's so much to unpack here. I I think we'll we'll query user or listeners to get an idea of what else should we dive into here because this is. I do want to do a timeline of 
insurance product innovation. Because I think that would be super interesting for us to, with with no with no research mm-hmm. as to when stuff came out. Like it just has to be us thinking about the logical flow of when things would have come. Yeah, into play. absolutely. And and I think maybe one of the interesting things, going back right to the beginning of where you started the conversation around, I uh, how technology as well and all sorts of things have been designed to model catastrophes. Mm. I we think about and and also about catastrophe being one of the biggest sources of premium for the reinsurance markets at large. Whilst it has driven a huge amount of innovation, we've got this mega imaginary diagram that we've just drawn for our listeners. Interestingly, what it's done is to some extent, I think, alienate some of the other products or leave them Mm. maybe a little neglected in its wake, right? Because some of those structures that work so well for a a location and event-based stochastically modelable uh, parameter fixable yeah. uh, type of loss scenario over a short uh, tail of event yeah. is a set of characteristics that do not correspond to many other long tail liability lines, political and credit risk lines, like all sorts yeah. of uh, completely different heads of, of and tails of risk yeah. uh, that, that don't match this yeah. over innovated catastrophe space right i think I casualty wonder, is is miles behind so that. if i think about it from a, a timeline perspective and it, it it feels akin to sort of historical timelines of like um traditional evolution to a degree right um you have these long gaps between like ages right in human in human evolution and then towards the end where we are now lots is happening really really quickly if you painted us as being at the end of history no, so here, here's Very my thinking. Here's thing. my thinking okay, is if, <laughs> if property cat is there, right, and now we're in this this phase where all the innovation is stacking and it's, a mm-hmm. lot is happening in a much more condensed window, could you make the claim that like casualty in other classes is going to be on the same path, but is first, they're at a different point in the journey? So it's almost like they're staggered, right? Mm-hmm. So where property cat had like another in the human evolution piece, another 500 year, 500 million years of like starting point, would we have it where they will follow a similar path, but the the innovation required for them to get to their rapidly stacking evolution is maybe a decade out, right? Are they just right. are they just lagged from where property cap might be? Maybe I, I like I like the thinking. I don't want to paint us as as being at the you know the end of of progress and, no, and the, the spike of the relent- exponential gro- growth curve in the same you know direction <laughs> led by our industry at the moment I, I think there's room for pivots still and there's room for mm. even bigger changes uh, to come but i agree with you that uh, it does feel like were we to say that catastrophes innovation path were one route mm-hmm. that casualty has not progressed as far along that route yeah. It'd be very interesting to see if casualty finds an entirely different measure Ooh. of progress yep. that goes in a different direction in some ways. And we have some sort of fin de siècle turning point that takes us into a new direction yeah. for reinsurance led by other constraints. But oh, This is several podcasts stuffed into one tight episode. Sadly, Love without that. constraints, there is no creativity. And the constraint <laughs> in this case is time. <laughs> so until next time, thanks, everyone. See you soon.